lot of people sick today, from my understand. Anna and your group, and this is y'all's 18th anniversary, Michael. Kristen's family's sick. They got COVID. Well, it, it's all your fault. You live down that way. You must have blown the air down that way, got him sick. Now, Kristen and the two girls are sick right now. Pray, pray that Caleb and, and uh, Ben, that guy. <laughs> Don't you feel bad when I forget your name? Half time, I can't even remember my own family. It is your fault. <laughs> you know, COVID is COVID is actually not bad compared to some of the junk that's going around. I mean, look what Pat and Ron got, you know, or some of these respiratory things are horrible. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem. House of Bread, or House of Fighters, near Jerusalem during the reign of King Herod. After Jesus' birth, a group of spiritual priests from the east came to Jerusalem and inquired of the people, Where is this child who is born king of the Jewish people? We observed his star rising in the sky, and we've come to bow before him in worship. King Herod was overjoyed. King Herod was shaken to the core when he heard this, and not only him, but all of Jerusalem was disturbed when they heard this news. Now, you think about this, you know, I'm, like I, I said earlier, I'm glad we didn't sing We Three Kings of Orientar smoking on a rubber cigar. It was loaded and... Exp no, I'm sorry. I, I, every time we sing, I remember that kid stuff that we created for it, but... You know, it just makes there's these three kings that came. So there's these three little guys, and they show up. Herod's not going to pay any attention to three guys on camels. It, it just, no, this was an entourage. If these guys had come, there would have been a hundred or more people in this entourage. There would have been those that guarded. There would be more priests than just three in this thing. So this was a huge entourage. So we got Jerusalem's attention, and Herod, of course, wanted to see these guys, and, and, and that's what they did. They came into Herod's court, and he, he welcomed them in, I'm sure, and asked, what you doing here, and all that. Oh, we're come to worship the newborn king. We've come to worship the king of Israel. And, of course, these are, these are, are Gentiles, um, uh, and they're, they're called magi, um, or astrologers. Of course, when we hear the word astrology, we think of the negative context of that. Um, but what you've got to understand, first of all, this is a big entourage. Secondly, these guys that came probably had a lineage from Daniel. Daniel was the chief magio, where you get magi from, magio, over in, in Babylon when he was there. And he was over all of the, of the uh, astrologers in Babylon. And he never condemned anything that they studied. He just didn't like what they ate. He wanted it to be kosher. That was his only request to the guy over him at the time. But later he became the chief guy uh, because of you know, his great wisdom. I would imagine all of them became um, kosher after they saw how Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how those guys operated hearing God, you know, and, and seeing and, and interpreting and all these kind of things. So they go, oh, we're going to go kosher too, you know. Who knows? But you've got to realize that Daniel probably inspired them with what was coming. When they studied stars, when they studied all of this stuff, 
he did. Now, something else you have to understand, that before we understood it as Satan's astrology, you have to understand that's what happened to it. It became... Um, it became uh, counterfeited. Originally, the Zodiac, if you ever look at it, and D, Dr. D. James Kennedy, if you ever go and read his book, it's fantastic. He gives the true meaning of the Zodiac. And it, it talks about it in scriptures. If you ever read the scriptures, it says, the gospel is written in the stars. And he takes each place and points and shows from his birth, from, from the nation, all of the stuff, Israel, everything, till his death and resurrection, everything is in the zodiac, in the stars. That's the true zodiac. That's the true whatever it was that, that Daniel understood and studied when he studied that stuff because he knew this is what God was saying. And he could point to and say, now see, this when this happens, that's when the, it's going to present himself. And so these magi later on knew there was this strange star, his star, by the way. It says his star. The interesting thing is nobody else saw this star. Ever notice that? Nobody else saw this star. It's just the magi. It, doesn't, it, does, it talks about nowhere else does it say, and these, these um, guys that came and worshiped Jesus, there was a star. No, we just assume there was a star because of all the pageantry that we put around it. The only ones that saw the star that had any meaning to them were these magi who were coming from Mesopotamia or Iran, somewhere over there. They were coming, and it was a long way. And it probably took them a couple of years from the first time they saw this star, which would have been when Jesus was born. And they came. Anyway, King Herod's all upset, and he calls the meeting of the Jewish ruling priests and religious scholars, demanding that they tell him where the promised Messiah was prophesied to be born. He'll be born in Bethlehem in the land of Judah, they told him, because the prophecy states... And you, little Bethlehem, are not insignificant among the clans of Judah. For out of you will emerge the shepherd king of my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the spiritual priests from the east to ascertain the exact time the star first appeared. He told them, How, Now go to, to Bethlehem and carefully look there for the child. And when you found him, report to me so that I can go and bow down and worship him too. And so they left. And on their way to Bethlehem, suddenly the same star they had seen in the east reappeared. Amazed, they watched as it went ahead of them and stopped directly over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were so ecstatic that they shouted and celebrated with unrestrained joy. Now, when you read the original language, that's what it was. They were dancing, they shouted, they celebrated with unrestrained joy. Hear, hear this entourage in little tiny Bethlehem outside of a house. By this time, they were no longer in a stable. They didn't come when the shepherds did. That's just how we put it all together at Christmas time. They came two years later. Jesus was almost two. Why did Herod go and kill everybody under two? Oh, I, 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 I'm ahead of myself here. That story hadn't come yet. But, but they, you know, they ascertained from when they saw the star. Anyway, when they came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they were overcome. Falling to the ground at his feet, they worshipped him. And they opened their treasure boxes full of gifts and presented him with gold and frankincense and myrrh. Afterward, they returned to their own country by another route because God had warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod. You know, I find all of this so interesting because, you know, so many people give Satan such a, a big deal. 
Now, granted, he's shrewd, he's he, all that kind of stuff. But he's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. And, and he doesn't even realize that this is truly the king of the Jews being born in Bethlehem. So he, he, he doesn't even know to go there and try and destroy him, even though later on that's what he wants to do. But the funny thing is, and, and, and of course, you know, What's, what even got me was the scholars, the Jewish scholars and, and the priests. Here, this entourage comes, the star, all this stuff. Yeah, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So they go to Beth. Why didn't they go down there and say, hey, yeah, let's go see this Messiah, right? I mean, I, I don't know. Why didn't they? They never knew. They never knew. Their eyes were shut. Their ears were shut. They didn't know. Well, anyway, they came into the house or came to the house. I would imagine there were so many of them anyway, but they brought their chests. There wouldn't have been these little tiny boxes. Here's a little gold. Here's a little bit of frankincense and a little bit of myrrh. They came with huge camels full of stuff. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh would have been would have been the amazing gifts that they gave them. They probably gave them clothes and all kinds of other stuff and, 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 and the mules to carry this because how in the world the next day they are, he says, you know, God says, go to Egypt, right? They brought chests full of stuff. Jesus was wealthy at his birth or two years later. They were pretty poor up till then. Then they were quite wealthy. And they, it probably took them through their time in Egypt and even back when they were in Nazareth for a period of time that, that stuff took care of them that's just the way God does it takes care of his child his children that includes you and they opened their gifts and presented him with these things and then they went a different way and after they had gone, Joseph had another dream. An angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Get up now, flee to Egypt. Take Mary and the little child and stay there until I tell you to leave. For Herod intends to search for the child to kill him. So that night they got up, took Jesus and his mother and made their escape to Egypt and remained there until Herod died. All of this fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through his prophet. I summoned my son out of Egypt so interesting because God summoned the nation of Israel out of Egypt his son goes and God summons him out of Egypt there's a lot of neat little stuff there anyway when Herod realized that he had been tricked by the wise men he was infuriated so he sent his soldiers with orders to slaughter every baby boy two years old and younger in Bethlehem and throughout the surrounding countryside, based on the time frame he was given from the interrogating the wise men. And this fulfilled the words of the prophet Jeremiah. I hear the screams of anguish, weeping and wailing in Ramah. Ramah is a metaphor for Israel. Rachel is weeping, or I mean Rachel is. Rachel is weeping uncontrollably for her children. And she refuses to be comforted because they are dead and gone. You know, as I read that, my mind and heart flashed back to October 7th. And I thought, you know what? Things just don't change much, do they? The, the horrible darkness of the evil one and how he so wants to destroy the Jews, how he so wants to destroy believers in, in Yeshua. He, he, that, that's his heart and anguish. Um. I'm ashamed sometimes in these days to call myself a Jew when I see Jews marching with Hamas in protest of what Israel's doing. I, I, and not only that, I'm, I am freaking amazed at the women who join these groups to do that. They would be the first ones that Hamas would get rid of. And then there's the whole LGBTQ community. 
Hamas would wipe them out, stone them, do whatever. He hates, they hate that stuff. And yet they get into these marches and talk about this horrible anti-Semitism. Listen, if you have places you can speak out, I don't care where it is, you ought to be speaking out. Oh, I, I need to be quiet. I don't want to be, you know. You're next. You're next. And anyway, I felt it's funny because Christmas, the whole time of Christmas, I, I listened to uh, some stations from over in Israel. And the whole time I'm thinking we're having fun and doing great and all this, and they're in the course of a horrible war, and all those soldiers that are fighting to to rid it to rid Gaza of of these barbarians, and um, you know I've been in war, so to sit there and think about these these guys during what we're doing with our holidays, and they 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 had guys celebrating during that time with Hanukkah and all that stuff. And yet how peaceful it is all around us for the most part, right? I mean, we have a lot going on in our country and nation with, with crime and everything, but we're not at war. And we're not sending our sons to war anymore right now. They're all pretty much out of, out of the war zones. In a way, we got some stationed around the world. And I thought about that, and my heart went out, especially considering how this little country, this no bigger than New Jersey, how all of the nations of the world, and so many of them hate Israel, and so many of them love the horrible ones. I'm talking about murderers and, and, you know. Israel in itself, if you think about it, they tolerate all this stuff. Their women have rights. They, they can go to school. They can get educated. They can do all that stuff. But not if you're living under that regime in Gaza. You have no right. You're a baby machine. That's it. And you're required to marry who you who they tell you to marry. I know I'm getting you depressed and all that kind of stuff, but I have a point. I forgot what it was, but I have a point. <laughs> you know, it's so amazing to me how God orchestrates what he does. And how easy it is just in watching that stuff and looking at it. It is for a, a cloud to come over you and to feel depressed and dark and whatever it may be. And yet realize that, that God is in control. That doesn't mean we don't mourn for. It doesn't mean we don't stand up for. But the amazing thing is that God is sovereign and he... He is totally in control. I don't care what it is in your life that you may think is, is, is chaotic or out of whatever. The whole word in its sense, shalom, means to bring order out of chaos. That's a God word. And he's even God, shalom. Jehovah, shalom. And his whole design, when you look at this, this, this picture of Jesus' birth and these kings coming that were Gentiles, it's amazing that Gentiles worshipped and, and, and gave riches to, to the king of Israel um, from those same countries that want to destroy Israel. But it, it's so interesting to me how God put that together, how he provided for, for Mary and Joseph. How he orchestrated when they would come and when. Listen to me. There is no difference in your life right now because the Messiah came and was born in you. 
And when he was born in you, God's same focus came into you and into your life that it was when Jesus was born into this world and walked through this world. Yeah, but so when Jesus was crucified, well, you may be one day. But guess what? Hallelujah. Now, I'm not getting a bus for martyrs, okay? I have no desire right now. I have no desire to be a martyr. I really don't. I don't have a desire to be persecuted either. But if it happens, okay, then off to the camps I'll go. And wherever I have to go and however God dis decides that's my track, then, then I'll go to the guillotine or whatever it may be. Because you know what? It doesn't matter. I know that my focus... My focus is on Him. You know, people can go through some horrible stuff, and sometimes we can say, oh, that's, that's so terrible. I, I want them to get out of that. And yet you may not realize that God may be taking them, allowing them to go through that stuff. He may just be allowing them. Why, you ask? I don't know, but he's God. And we just sang about his reckless love. There's no place you can run, no place you can hide, no mountain you can climb that he's not there. And that's from Psalm 139. And if you read on in Psalm 139, he says, All my thoughts to you are precious. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when you wake up, it's going to be the same. It's in Psalm 40, the same scripture. All my thoughts to you are precious. God doesn't think anything about you that's not precious. You do. You're sitting there going, well, everything in you is trying to fight against that. I got to read that scripture. I don't believe, I, yeah, I'm bad, I'm terrible. Who, who told you you were bad and terrible? There's a whole Gnostic viewpoint that says, oh, these bodies are terrible. Are you kidding me? Be careful. Because that's Gnosticism. That's not, Hebraic thinking. These bodies God created for a reason to carry this Holy Spirit that lives in us. And he says, glorify God in these bodies. If these bodies are terrible, then God's got a problem. Because Jesus... Jesus came in the flesh. And guess what? He rose from the dead. Bodily. Now we'll get new bodies, thank God. Because these old tired things are going to die away. Naturally. Because we're not sinless. But they're going to die. And I can't wait to get my new one. But I'll wait as long as God wants me here. But it'll be nice one day when nothing hurts. Right? No more tears. No more sadness. No more depression. No more any of those things. That God constantly, I believe, is always here to comfort us through, to bring healing and wholeness, to guide your life in the ways that He does. And when you don't understand, when you don't understand, think back about he, how he guided these huge entourage of magi to worship the king. How he guided them all the way to the little town of Bethlehem that was so insignificant. And they came and rejoiced with ecstatic great joy and brought him gifts. Guess what? Those same kings 
those same wealth pursues you. Now, you don't believe it? Oh, I, I, I. You know, we have all of our stupidities like, oh, I'm not worth that. Oh, God can't do Yeah, Yeah, that's you. You have the king of Israel living in you. The king. That's the kingdom of God. Lives in you. Remember, Father, thank you that you give us so much to remember. Thank you that at Christmas time we remember that you left your throne in glory and became a, a vulnerable baby. That we can remember that you grew up strong and you left us with words of comfort and grace and yet you died and rose again but you ascended and we can remember that you sent forth your Holy Spirit in power to empower us to walk in this world thank you that we can remember that we do walk empowered that we do live in your presence consistently and constantly and that you love us so, so, so much. God, let that pierce our hearts so deeply that as we come into this next year, we'll be changed just a little bit more, loving you just a little bit more, following after you with zeal and joy. Amen. We celebrate communion now. And for those who are visiting, as you come forward, our, our bread is gluten-free. The red cup is wine. The green is juice. We ask that you come down the outside aisles and up the middle, and we'll have prayer in the back. Um, as we celebrate this communion, the Lord's sacrifice for us is cleansing our sins. We celebrate also a covenant that he made with us. And that word is 